um, basically, I hope uh, everybody uh, in the audience can uh, get something new from uh, my talk today. Uh, there's a very small proportion of people who had uh, attended to this exactly the same story, but in Japanese language, I hope there's no overlap in the audience. Um, as Hamada san introduced, uh, this concept of flow was uh, initially presented and expanded by um, psychologist Chiksent Mihai, who used to be at uh, California as well and passed away two or three months ago. And he was very influential through many, many books. And uh, it's slightly different depending on uh, which year book you uh, read or who followers you follow. But uh, there are multiple psychological characteristics in the flow state, uh, starting with happiness, pleasure. Uh, and um, of course, it has lots of real impact in, uh, you know, it happens in business, uh, team tasks, education, sport, entertainment, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's characterized psychologically by attention and altered state of consciousness. Why do we say altered state of consciousness? consciousness? For instance, the uh, experience or feeling of how much time passed is completely screwed up in the uh, case of flow. And uh, from my perspective, it's something to do with the origin of social brain, something very, very fundamental between interbody and interbrain uh, empathy or sympathy. Um, uh, also, uh, people might be interested in whether or not solo flow and team flow uh, in what kind of relationship. Is the team flow just addition of single brain uh, flow? or there's something special happening in each brain and between brain. Um, of course, and then as I mentioned, uh, we are interested in individual differences in team flow. And uh, towards the end, if I have time, maybe I can mention some collaboration uh, related to how to break personal limit utilizing this flow state, although it's very, very preliminary. As a side note, I just published um, this book relatively recently, half a year, year ago with uh, the well-known uh, ex-athlete, runner, 400 hurdle uh, medalist in uh, World uh, Freedom Truck, uh, Dai tamese -san. Now, if you go into Chiksen Mihai's books and papers, uh, first thing you notice is that you need a proper challenge level in each individual to accomplish flow. If the task is too boring or your skill is too low, then it's very hard to accomplish flow. You have to have high level of skill, skills, which matches a very high level of challenge, then you have a chance, necessary condition for flow. And uh, they come up with, you know, this kind of flow uh, dimensions. And, um, uh, you know, I don't need to read this again, but later on, I will talk about a little bit of happiness, pleasure is here. And attention, out of state of consciousness are here. Uh, and um, uh, now, this much for the introduction to flow, and I want to sidestep, and I want to come back to my own lab's history. And the first thing I want to do is to show some um, YouTube videos, which some of you might have seen a lot of times, but I really love these. So here, do you see the uh, YouTube screen? Yes. Okay. So. It might be hard over remote, but what I want you to see is those, um, uh, you know, twinkling light up and down of, um, you know, fireflies, hotaru in Japanese. And the point here is that they are not entirely random. They're sort of like wavy, uh, quasi synchrony or weak coupling of the timing among those individuals, right? So it's not entirely synchronized, but it's not entirely random either. Uh, likewise, uh, if your sound is okay, you hear folk sounds. Yes. And it's not entirely random. It's not entirely flat, homogeneous, white noise. It's really up and down, some sort of wavy kind of uh, rhythmic thing happening here. Okay. Why is this anything to do with what I'm doing? I'll tell you later. Now, one thing you would say that this is the uh, evolutionary biological origin of human social interaction, then uh, a lot of people might um, criticize me. Indeed, I got criticized a lot by social psychologists saying, gee, what do you mean by social interaction in human? It's very symbolic and it's very barbar. It's nothing to do with what you're talking about in the blog speaking. Well, 
if you think that way, I want you to see the next thing. This is about mother baby entrainment. And I love this uh, YouTube movie. Okay, I'm switching this again. So I hope you both see the video and sound. It's a delay in the remote Zoom access, so it might be not perfect, but uh, pay attention to the timing of mom uh, singing uh, with her face profile uh, appearing here at the beginning, and then how the baby's mouth and the emotional expression changes, including head movement. Okay, I watch this forever. I love this. The, the mother singing is so good, but the baby is so cute. And the point is that this is the mom baby entrainment has been um, considered the origin of nonverbal communication. And that's what I mean by developmental and biological origin of social interaction. Now, what is tricky, however, is that this is not limited to light, it could be just physics. And the next demo, I show this hundreds of times to everybody. Metronome. I don't even know where the physics center is. I think it's somewhere in tissue. And I want you to pay attention to the timing, the phase differences of these metronomes. It's very interesting because at one moment, you get synchronized by counterfeit. Some of them are counterfeit. And then it's decoupled again. And after a little while, the majority of them uh, started moving together. Okay, and if you keep watching, then it's decoupled. But the point is that it's loosely coupled. And another important point is that why this happened, the important aspect of this is the bass, right? The bass is uh, sort of like uh, slightly swinging and it's sort of um, hung by strings. It's not entirely stable, and that's the key. In fact, if you see it, it's moving around a little bit, swinging together with the uh, metronomes. I do like the other version better, which is pet vocal version. And over here, I want you to pay attention to the barbarous, um between left and right bottles. And initially the timing is entirely independent, but after a little while, it's kind of getting some pattern of weak synchrony. And again, the trick is not so much of the relationship for distance of the bottom. It's attached to the common plate. That's really the necessary condition. Okay. Uh, this might be enough for the demo. I hope it can be back to the slide. So the point is that I would argue that those biological uh, inter-individual bodily synchrony is the uh, key to understand human body sync and human brain sync as the basis for social interaction. And then the human um, mom baby entrainment would be sort of like the uh, connecting missing link but when I gave this talk previously, uh, Aihara sensei at Todai pointed that uh, his son, Ikkyo-san, is studying this. This is uh, written in Japanese, but uh, this is Japanese acoustic society. And he's studying, you know, this 
uh, frog squeaking and how it's uh, coupled uh, to get sync in sync. And in frog's case too, uh, I would say it's social, you know, it's not just by accident. So uh, there's another, some other things that I recently discovered that's very interesting. Um, when we saw uh, Paralympic games, uh, the visually handicapped or entirely blind uh, runner is uh, guided by sighted volunteer runner uh, with a uh, rope, you know, or string. But those are very tight, very loose. And that loose but connected is very important in this case too. And in fact, I think um, uh, some scholars like um, uh, Asaito uh, is indicating that, uh, you know, from her interview with them, that, uh, you know, this uh, interaction is very, very critical for, you know, uh, the couple, the uh, Morantia and the handicapped Rana. And they cannot just newly establish uh, the relationship. It's just accumulated over time. Uh, and uh, the other thing I want to say is that one focus for lab is really about interdisciplinary functions, which are characterized, in my opinion, in two very distinctive features. One is that intrinsically and almost by definition, it is somatic and physiological. And also, it is social, meaning it's uh, in relationship, uh, dynamic relationship with other brain, uh, via uh, body and sensory organs. Uh, so uh, I already showed the metronome waters. Uh, some of those who are familiar with the uh, history of philosophy might think of this thing, and a uh, um, has pendulum clock, uh, meaning that in the old house you have a big pendulum clock, and then another pendulum clock in different room, and then they uh, not, nothing to do with each other, but at one moment you realize that they are synchronized together. The key here is that it's in the same uh, house with the very old wall is connecting them together, just like uh, Ikeguchi Sensei's demo of metronome and water. Uh, of. In the human analogy, I think uh, that's the body, physical body, and also sensory system. Uh, those are the wall in Hoihen's case. So body synchrony is uh, in a way nothing to do with the explicit symbolic linguistic social communication, but it should be still considered essential considering all these uh, physical, biological, and developmental uh, evidence that it's essential to the origin of the social interaction. Um, now, when um, we're talking about social brain in cognitive neuroscience, it's a hot topic, but there are three possible different levels. The first level is that um, even when sens so sensory systems are designed optimally to make uh, fine social tuning and uh, emotional communication. So even when uh, it's responding to some non-living stimulus, like you know LED, for instance, uh, in the case of color, it's still uh, showing its uh, tuning or sensitivity to socially relevant stimulus. That's the level number one. And level number two, uh, in fact, if you st uh, stimulate the same brain by um, non-social and social stimulus, uh, the brain is respond most vigorously to social stimuli, especially when it's live and real time. And this was very, very witnessed in infant behavioral uh, psychophysics. Uh, and uh, we do have some evidence that even sensory cross-modal adaptation uh, is enhanced or suppressed or transferred uh, between uh, people. Now, of course, social brain can point to much more restricted situation where indeed two brains are interacting real time in the laboratory or in the sport game or something, and we are measuring it. So this is really the social live interaction uh, uh, measured, and that's sort of like uh, the narrowest sense. But people do not tend to forget number one level and number two level. So I just wanted to mention. So uh, we are interested in this uh, level three, which is two brain interacting via bodies and environment, and we could capture by simultaneous hyperscan. And uh, uh, earlier, uh, with Katsumi Watanabe and his group, uh, we did this Kokuri experiment. Uh, this is meant to study uh, implicit, uh, unintended uh, interaction and synchrony uh, between uh, two, person, two people's body movements. The task is to point to each other like this um, image here and um, uh, don't influenced by the opponent, just try to fixate 
stabilize your finger as stable as possible while you have to open your eyes. And this is the most boring video because even if I run it, nothing happens. But if you scrutinize, maybe, you know, over here, there's a little bit of tiny movement between the fingers. Even though both of them are trying to stabilize the fingers, uh, they have very microscopic movement. And um, if you plot this fingertip, uh, co uh, you know, the, uh, in the coordinate system, you know, blue is one person, uh, red is partner, and then their tip of fingers are sort of moving together. As I said, it's weakly captured. And of course, if you are expert on those nonlinear system dynamics, uh, you could say, you know, strange attractor and, uh, you know, things like that. So um, this is the uh, microsynchrony between bodies without conscious awareness. And uh, how do we analyze this? This is you know, basically using you know, this um, cross-correlation uh, technique. Uh, basically, this is the movement of some spatial axis in subject number one. Subject number two's finger is also recorded. And then slide the time like this to find the maximum correlation, highest correlation. And then you can plot it this way. Right, and then in this case, there's no distinction between leader and follower. It's the mutual, so time zero lag has the highest uh, finger movement uh, correlation, or uh, by definition, this is synchrony. And uh, what you can do is to do some sanity check, as Watanabe and his group uh, did it. Uh, so if you have paired, then you have higher uh, level of a synchrony as opposed to randomly shuffled post hoc pair, meaning that it is important to have a live partner in front uh, with live interaction, even though your intention is not to move, it's critical for this implicit bodily synchrony. Right, and um, just one subject in this case, but, um, oh, sorry, this is eight subjects. Um, we also try to figure out whether it's just a practice effect or something else. So we did uh, session one, two, but session seven, A2, and uh, it's not increased significantly. So uh, just by repeating this test session is not that critical. Uh, I forgot to mention, but uh, what we did was to, sorry, I forgot to mention, but what we did was to have this, you know, neglect each other as pretest, as stable as possible. And then there's a training session where leader is leading, follower is following, some cooperative training, and then come back to the post-test, which is again neglect to each other. And then this uh, co competitive experience increases implicit movement like this, okay? Yeah, and uh, I have to skip some details, but we did various uh, different controls, such as uh, what if the opponent is not a live human, just a dot moving on the display, but this movement is taken from real uh, person finger. Uh, how about the partner is a recorded video? You know, uh, how about the experimenter or the one participant uh, has blindfold? All these things turn out to be uh, losing the synchrony. So basically, uh, live real interaction with real person is the necessary condition for this corporate training uh, increasing the uh, body synchrony. Now, of course, you can move on to uh, interbrain EG uh, recording, and this is called hyper scanning. Why are they are doing this? It looks like this uh, one to eight channels in each brain. And this is uh, just skipping the results, but the main result is the um, contrast between pre and post test. So, in both tests, subjects' task is to just neglect each other, just try to stabilize the finger, but uh, due to the in-between cooperative training or as the control condition, non-cooperative uh, movement, uh, their post-brain uh, activity is different relative to pre. And this shows the brain area, which is uh, showing the maximum difference between pre and post. And one area is right middle temporal gyrus in this uh, beta um, uh, frequency range. And then the other is this area called precuneus uh, in slightly lower um, uh, brainwave frequency. So these two areas activity were increased by 
uh, cochlear training, uh, even though while they are trying to fi fixate uh, their fingers. Now you can, of course, do some functional interpretation of why these areas are relevant. Uh, the right M uh, MTG uh, has been uh, sort of modified uh, with regard to theory of mind and empathy, and also it's something to do with sense of agency, etc. Precuneness is very popular area in social uh, neuroscience in these days, something to do with uh, highly integrated tasks, including visual spatial imagery, episodic memory retrieval, and first person perspective taking, that's kind of important, and the experience of agency again. So these are not entirely irrelevant to uh, you know, what they are doing between two people, uh, quote, social. So cooperative training, enhanced neural activity for theory of mind, uh, sense of agency, and sympathy kind of area. Now, this is a summary of inter brain connectivity, which is uh, basically measured by PDC, partial directed coherence. And this is a hard figure, uh, so I have to explain. The left side all together is pre test. The right side all together is the post test after uh, sort of like entrainment training. Okay. And the uh, left quarter, most quarter is inter brain uh, pre. And then intra brain uh, connectivity pre, and then inter brain post and intra brain uh, post. So intra brain means within our brain, and nothing happens, you know, in terms of PDC. But if you look at this square box and this box uh, was indicated by these two arrows, uh, the partial directed coherence between the brain only when they are DR partners were increased. Okay, so interbrain synchrony is actually increased. And this is showing the same thing with slightly different uh, way, two brains. Uh, by leader and follower, what we mean is not during pre and post test, but during the corporate training, one side is leading in front of the, uh, uh, the, the other subject, moving fingers, and then the other is following. And they repeated this for several minutes, okay? And after that, now post-training uh, test, there's no read and follower there in that session, but still there's some intriguing asymmetry between leader's brain and follower's brain. Uh, IFG is here, um, posterior, posterior occipital is here, and there's, you know, the stick uh, lines indicate uh, stronger coherence. Uh, this thing is weaker, but uh, similar results with beta and uh, theta. Altogether, it's relatively slow, you can see. Yeah, these are just in interpretations. Maybe the state of connectivity, maybe something with active suppression of response. Maybe this is active concentration. We don't know. I mean, these are just uh, speculation. But uh, what we found interesting is that there's this carrying over effect of leader follower relationship, even in this very implicit domain, uh, even in this brain domain, interbrain uh, connectivity data between leader and follower. There's one case that we tested with autism subject. And uh, this is one participant officially diagnosed high function autism with the other partner as the experimenter. And then uh, this um, pretest post set blue and red are the pooled result from uh, neurally, ty neurally typical uh, participants. And then this. Uh, red purple curve is the post ASD. So ASD did not increase the synchrony with the partner after even cooperative training. Okay. Adaptation is actually synchrony during the uh, cooperative training. So ASD can follow the finger, but it doesn't do anything socially to the brain. That's what it is. Um, still, Lots of social psychologists complain that this is nothing to do with what's been known about, um, you know, uh, social psychological uh, characteristics of interpersonal interaction. So we actually used uh, their typical uh, social traits uh, questionnaire, and it turned out that some of the um, uh, index, like fear of negative evaluation or blushing of uh, propensity, 
were actually correlated with uh, the interbrain uh, quotient. So indeed, it's really uh, correlated with social traits. So the fear of a negative evaluation is lower than the stronger interpersonal connectivity. And that's shown here by minus a coefficient and positive uh, and a small p value. So to summarize, uh, the baseline synchrony uh, was there between two participants and uh, interpersonal adaptation increases correlation uh, in, 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 in the behavior domain. And uh, in terms of social localization, uh, right uh, MTG and uh, right precunus in relatively low frequency band uh, seems to be significantly activated by uh, bodily uh, entrainment or cooperative training. Um, the interbrain uh, measure of partial directed coherence, which is the one synchrony measure, uh, increases after adaptation. And it's something to do with theory of mind or uh, infrared uh, frontal gyrus uh, network uh, seems to be uh, involved. And autism, very few results. To be honest, we have more autism data later. And then it really depends on the individual. But overall, they don't show increase by social cooperative training. Maybe they just didn't perceive it as social cooperative at all. All right, so basically uh, so far, uh, we can say that in any existing natural languages, people have this uh, allegorical expression of, you know, he and I have the same wavelengths. Uh, you know, I get along with her because we have the same wavelengths. It's just allegorical usage, but it turned out to be not just entirely uh, a metaphor. Now, uh, now uh, put aside the interbrain sync a little while and then uh, talk about the flow, uh, in this case, solo flow. And this is just one example of a typical fMRI study of solo flow. And then they indicate hippofrontal activity here, hippo, not the hyper. But the point here is that this is just uh, one study. Typical uh, manipulation is like uh, manipulating by the task or the game challenge level. Uh, just come up with three conditions, boredom, flow, and overload, and then just show what happens here in the flow condition relative to the other two conditions. So there's no guarantee that subjectively uh, the participants are really getting into flow uh, during this uh, condition. They just want to call it flow condition as a condition. So it's kind of very limited. Uh, there are other uh, attempts in the uh, laboratory to uh, generate flow. Uh, as you may realize, the first challenge to study flow in the laboratory is that you have to create real flow experience in the laboratory, and that's not trivial. Because they are paid subjects. They come to you know new lab and then just have sticking electrodes. Okay, get into flow, please. You cannot easily do that. But people try, and there's some success by Tetris game uh, for chess players, the chess mathematical uh, game or quiz. And then in our lab, we did uh, this study of shooting game. This was very popular at that time. There are lots of super uh, game players we can find in Caltech Dogs. So we did that, we did EEG, and we did path analysis in the brain. This is just a summary. And this anterior cingulate and uh, temporal pole were sticking out as the uh, unique uh, nodes uh, during flow. And uh, these red arrows are indicating causal influence uh, positively uh, during the flow and the blue is during uh, non-flow. So basically to summarize, uh, functional connectivity is enhanced selectively in flow condition. And then there's the very strong mutual link between anterior cingulate and temporal pole that seems to be critical for the solo flow neural correlates. Uh, and overall, we could probably generalize in saying top-down influence is enhanced while bottom-up is inhibited as indicated here in this blue arrow. Now, uh, before we move on to team flow, I would like to just um, emphasize one thing, which is related to this very fundamental philosophical question as to how we could objectively approach and understand the subjective experience, because the flow uh, state is by definition very, very subjective. But we'd like to have very good uh, index objectively of yes, now this person is getting into flow. And then we like to also have some unique identifiable neural correlates to indicate that this is indeed flow. 
So how do we do this? Because, you know, one side, it is subjective. One side, we want to have behavior, objective, and neural. So uh, here, what I noticed was my own personal experience with my mom when I was a childhood. I was very much into detective stories and science fiction as a science fiction boy. So I was reading, you know, Arthur Charles Clarke, um, uh, Isaac Asimov, all those people, and, um, you know, uh, Lupin uh, story and stuff like that. And um, I forgot the time because I was so much absorbed into the story. And then my mom from downstairs yelled to me several times, Shin, you know, dinner time, come downstairs. And I never listened, I never hear. I don't remember I heard her voice. So I neglected and neglected. And after fifth time or sixth times, my mom was really, really mad coming in, running upstairs and said, why did you neglect and tell my voice? I was shocked. I didn't neglect, I just didn't hear it because uh, my mom's voice at the time was task irrelevant stimulus, right? What is a task? Task is to follow the story in the book. So I realized that, uh, you know, this from this my personal experience, task irrelevant stimuli are suppressed. And it's been actually said one of the very distinctive feature of uh, tele presence experience or immersive experience of the flow, meaning that you are living into the game world, you are living into the sport. You're living into that virtual world or real world and then neglecting everything or suppressing actively everything irrelevant, right? So we could use this, I realized, as the both objective and subjective index of this particular person, the particular brain is into flow. So what we did was to measure, uh, uh, stimulate the brain of the game player with task irrelevant sound flows. On purpose, uh, Muhammad Shehata, the first author of the study, used a door knocking sound. It's really like boom, 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 door knocking sound. Uh, and we measured auditory evoked potential, gross significant attenuation of that auditory evoked potential to task irrelevant stimuli. Uh, we took it as the objective, neural, and at the same time, subjective uh, major uh, index of the flow. And this is common in solo flow study and team flow study. So I will have to emphasize this, okay? Now, I don't need to probably uh, give a textbook uh, introduction of auditory evoked potential, but basically uh, this is um, uh, the example that the early component, the later component, zero is the stimulus onset, the sound, right? And the early exogenous component, the endogenous component, uh, and uh, these are known, like effect of increasing age, uh, you know, slowing down, effect of hearing loss, of course, amplitude is getting less, uh, both early and late component. But what is interesting is this uh, tinnitus, meaning it's like, you know, illusory uh, ringing sound, annoying uh, echoing sound in the ear, it's illusory and hallucination. Now, what happens is that early component, nothing happens, but later component, it's attenuated and maybe a little bit slower. And I would think when you are playing game and you're really getting into, absorbed into the game, uh, you are paying attention and enhance the stimulus relevant to the task, both visual and auditory. But uh, as a um, uh, compensation, you suppress task relevant stimulus such as you know knocking the door sound or mom's voice or something like that. So we expect something like this. And indeed this was happening. I hope you do understand the logic this much. And of course, we are uh, having that as the tool, we get into team flow uh, domain. And I don't need to explain this team flow, team flow in music, team flow maybe in soccer game. I just watched uh, Japan won China, uh, great. <laughs> but uh, you know, these situations or any team activity, you can imagine team flow. Uh, this is what we did in uh, our laboratory. We use this uh, music game. I hope you hear what sound and you see the movie. Your task is to hit the uh, bar at the right timing relative to the music. But I want you to pay attention also, this repeated kung 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 kung, this sound. Do you hear the sound? Kung 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 kung. So basically, 
we simulate a situation where you are absorbed into a game in your room, dormitory room, and somebody knocked the door. You don't even hear it. Why did you hear it? That's the thing. Uh, we also actually have three conditions uh, because we want to compare a uh, team flow possible condition, which is shown in this video, two people play together. Uh, team only situation where the music was scrambled. So it's uh, just synchrony button press task, but it's not interesting at all. So there's no chance they got into team flow or solo flow either. It's just being together. And then there's this solo flow condition where we put occlusion, occlusion between two people so that each one of them are uh, playing independently and they can fall into solo flow regardless of the other. So these three conditions we put. And of course, compare these three conditions while monitoring the AEP to the task irrelevant auditory stimulus, as I said. And also, don't, uh, don't forget, we compare that with post hoc questionnaire. And from post hoc questionnaire, we came up with solo flow index, team flow index, and just social interaction index. Those three are different. Okay, makes sense. Uh, we have lots of collaborators and it's published last year. And, you know, again, we did something like this, you know, two uh, brain are scanned together. Now, if you think about team flow, of course, you're talking about, uh, you know, what would make the team's best in performance and, you know, give the highest level of pleasure. You know, there are criteria like common purpose, complementary skills, uh, clear performance goals, keep a strong commitment, mutual accountability, etc. And indeed, uh, NASA uh, asked us to um, perform some uh, investigation related to uh, astronauts' performance in a very limited spaceship for many years. And uh, according to them, uh, they have to do something beyond 200 uh, or 250 tasks per day. Uh, each, each one task uh, lasts from several minutes to hours, and then they have to work always with almost identical or similar teams. So they asked us, do you have any indication as to, uh, you know, there are good team and bad team, and can you tell from your neural activity, and also can you predict? And then what if a team is getting into team flow, and then they moved on to different task? Like initially, it's pretty much motor coordination task. And the second one is pretty much like problem solving uh, in symbolic domain. Are those situation transferable in terms of team flow? In other words, one team flow in one task transferred to the other task. And those are the very good questions. Uh, we did study a little bit and then we don't have very strong conclusion, but I'll tell you something related towards the end. Okay, first point I wanna make is, as I said, we came up with from questionnaire, uh, you know, solo flow index, team index, and team flow index. So this team index is team non-flow index. It's just social interaction, but not flow. And as you can see, solo flow index, uh, this um, green and blue, which are solo flow and uh, team flow is going high relative to non-flow. And team flow uh, index, only the um, team flow condition are getting high and, um, sorry, a non-flow condition is getting high. Uh, and um, this team flow in index, the team flow is getting high. So uh, basically uh, these um, questionnaire and uh, uh, subjects reports are consistent uh, and support our experimental uh, manipulation. Now, of course, we still use this uh, AEP as the filter for which period uh, they are into the flow, even among uh, these three conditions. Okay, um, so uh, we did this um, auditory box potential uh, and um, we just had a, a flow index uh, and uh, auditory box potential task relevant uh, against each other in three conditions. And it makes sense, right? Because in this case, uh, task relevant stimulus should be neglected more and more when the flow level is high, both in solo flow condition and team flow condition. And that's indicated by this negative slope. Uh, this is team flow, this is solo flow. 
and this is non-flow interaction and there's no correlation because sure, I mean, you have a boring conversation with somebody and then there's an explosion behind you. Of course you pay attention, right? Your mom is yelling, of course you pay attention. So uh, this is also sort of confirmatory to what we wanted to manipulate. Now let's move on to neural coded flow. The first thing is that, um, you know, these are the three a top uh, level view of three conditions. Here are the several channels indicated by cross uh, in the left uh, medial temporal uh, area. And this is where the influence of suppression of the auditory evoked potential is most visible, most vigorous. And just utilizing these slide, uh, electrodes, you can do, you know, this uh, power spectrum frequency versus power uh, plot for uh, team flow as green, uh, non flow social combination as yellow as the baseline, and solo flow as this uh, pop, purple. And when you look at the higher frequency level, like, you know, 12, uh, beta, and low gamma, and high gamma, uh, maybe high gamma may not be that reliable for technical reason, but there's a clear uh, deviation of two solo conditions against the non flow condition in this area, but also most notably, uh, solo flow and team flow really diverge into the opposite direction, indicating strongly that neural correlates of team flow is distinctively different from that of no flow social and uh, that of solo flow, okay? And then uh, we kind of compare the neural versus subjective correlation. Again, horizontal axis is the team flow index and this is the left MTG, which we found as the team flow node uh, region of interest. Uh, and uh, this is positively correlated only in the team flow, not the solo flow. So again, this is uniquely uh, relevant to team flow state, but not solo flow state. Okay, so uh, one question long lasting we clarified is team flow, just as mere addition of uh, several brains a sort of flow together? No, there's something special happened between the brain. Okay. Now, of course, in a lot of studies in these days, you can do this kind of plot, you know, which area uh, is projected onto which, and uh, you can analyze separately again these three conditions. And again, I want you to pay attention to this team flow relative to this uh, team only or flow only. It's slightly different from uh, these. Right? These lines are the connectivity. So in short, uh, left um, uh, media, media temporal uh, receives information, receives, okay, receives information from RPFC, which is considered to be sort of like a flow uh, network and RIFC, which is considered to be sort of like social communication network. So it seems like LMTC is functioning as the integrator or integration node uh, receiving input from social network and flow network to realize team flow state. Now, of course, we are eventually interested in interbrain coherence. And, you know, there might be a stupid question, but when you are in team flow, do you feel like it's a single consciousness? This is, of course, a very strong uh, question. And what do you mean by single consciousness? It's very ambiguous. But let's just state a more a mild question as to whether the two brains of the teammates are connected during team flow? And the answer was yes. So there's an enhanced interbrain integrated information neurosynchrony. So here is the um, now it's Cheers uh, lab's contribution. They offered us uh, so-called phi uh, in integrated information theory, but they are all modified version, which is normalized. And as you can see, uh, these are the different uh, brain network in the horizontal axis in one participant. The other part, uh, participant is plotted uh, in the vertical uh, axis, but only real pairs are in here in the upper row. The lower row is again, as a sanity check, you can just shuffle unpaired two subjects and then see what kind of results you get as random noise. And that's shown in these three panels at the bottom. They are very low and then uh, you know, not so much different across these three conditions, of course. But in the pair condition, especially only in the team flow condition, there's lots of yellow and orange indicating that various areas between the two brain are connected more and even in terms of the phi measure. 
uh, when they are in the team floor. I was very excited and um, uh, asked uh, now to see if he interpret this as slightly integrated conscious consciousness between the brain. He said no. And uh, I was persuaded because this is a very, very limited uh, measure in only in long range um, um, integration. Uh, there's no evidence or actually no data on short range uh, neural connection. So uh, this is really, really limited part of the data. But even he was very surprised that we got this high uh, level of phi, which are uh, highly also consistent with our own measure of uh, uh, phase locked value, which is um, you know another measure of interbrain coherence. So uh, two measures highly consistent with each other in this selective results. Okay, so indeed, in team flow, your brain and your partner brain are in sync, but specific in particular wavelengths and specific in particular brain regions. Okay. Now here's uh, the new part. Um, probably have to worry about time. Uh, I think it's still okay, right? Uh, recently, we became interested in uh, individual differences in team flow. And the motivation was that uh, personal, so this is again a little bit philosophical in my case. What is individual differences, right? Um, the personality traits are treated as like the physical property of the body. As an analogy to it, it's like mental property of the body, which is unchanged regardless of the context, regardless of the situation. That's, I think it's highly dubious. And team flow is by definition context dependent because it's team, right? So uh, there might be some intriguing philosophical twist possible that we can start from interbrain interaction to characterize the brain itself, something like that. Of course, we didn't accomplish this. We so far uh, is still staying with the conventional uh, method of analyzing uh, within brain first and then talk about interbrain coherence. But still, uh, some EEG data analysis can be applied in the brain, uh, like you know, phi, you can calculate the same way within brain or between brains. Uh, PDC or phase lock value, PLV, uh, interbrain coherence uh, things, you can calculate the same way mathematically within the brain or interbrain. So uh, this way we can uh, you know, raise lots of questions feasibly answer technically. Uh, just to acknowledge uh, the main players of uh, studies, um, the early work of uh, interpersonal uh, body sync, Katsu Watanabe, uh, solo flow neural correlates, uh, Kyung Sik Yun, who is still at Caltech JPL, and the uh, you know IIT Phi major was conducted by uh, Naoto Chia and his lab. I think I'm done. Thank you.